Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak today. I'm, I'm here with two old friends, or I shouldn't say old, should I say this? Say fr friends we've known each other for a long time. So David and Brian, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. What I'm going to talk about is uh, the opioid addiction problem facing our, our commonwealth today. But before I do that, I, I want to just touch a bit upon collaboration. Uh, my, my intro said, I have 40 years of law enforcement experience. I started out as a Jefferson County police officer in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and then I joined the Drug Enforcement Administration as a special agent, did that for 24 years. And then I came to Jefferson Town, Kentucky to become the police chief of a, a suburban city in Louisville. And then on April 1st, 2016, the governor honored me by making me the commissioner of the Kentucky State Police. You know, I, I can recognize collaboration when I see it. I've worked for a county, a city, the feds, and now the state, and I recognize that we have to be in this game together. You know, the enemy is on the outside of the fence, not on the inside. And we as law enforcement, we as first responders, we as, as citizens of our commonwealth have to work together for the common good. I want to use two examples to, to, just to show how collaboration can be good in a bad situation. On 9-11 of 2001, I was assigned to DEA headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. It's directly across from the Pentagon. Like everybody else in America that morning, I was notified at 8.46 a.m. that a plane had penetrated the North Tower of the World Trade Center. We all thought it must be an airplane off course. Something has happened. It's an accident. But I went into, I, at the time, I was a special assistant to our director up on the top floor of DEA headquarters. And that office overlooks the District of Columbia and the Pentagon. I was with my back to the, the glass watching national television about this plane that had penetrated the North Tower. And then at 9.03 a.m., as we were watching, we heard and saw another plane penetrate the South Tower. Couldn't believe it. We're under attack. And then, unbelievably, at 9.37 a.m., Special Agent Bill Brown taps me. He just kind of elbows me and says, my God, look at that. And I look to the west, and I see American Airline Flight 77 coming from the west in plain view and penetrate the west side of the Pentagon. The black smoke started billowing. We all jumped in action. But what I saw then is what I want to talk about. I don't care if you were a DEA agent, an FBI agent, Arlington Fire, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, we all came together and we all pitched in for the common good. I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, but on that date, I saw America come together as I've never seen before. And every year that goes by, it seems like we just kind of forget about that. And then we start our bickering back and forth and blaming each other for what's going on. And we need to work together. I was reminded again on January 23rd of this year when I was sitting in my office in Frankfurt. At 8.57 a.m. Eastern Time, I heard there had been an active shooter at a high school in western Kentucky. I uh, contacted the governor's office. We went out we jumped in a DEA airplane and we flew to Marshall County. What I saw again was America coming together and more specifically Kentucky coming together. Didn't matter the color of your uniform, gray, brown, tan, blue, didn't matter. We all got there and worked together for the common good. What I learned when I got there was that 16 kids had been shot and two of them died. One was still laying on the floor when I got there, and we had to process a crime scene. You know, we all cried together, we all hugged each other, we prayed together, but we did our job. And that's collaboration. And that's what we need to do as a country. That's what we need to do as a state. And that's what we need to do as first responders. But I'm here this morning to talk about some additional challenges that we face in law enforcement. 
the two biggest issues that I face, well, one issue I face is just recruiting and retention and manpower. I would ask that you be patient with the Kentucky State Police. We're down to 810 troopers. At one time, we had 1,070. And then years ago, we merged with commercial vehicle enforcement. They're the guys you see in the brown cars and the brown uniforms. What we're doing is doing away with those and making everybody a trooper in a gray uniform. They're down to 68 officers, and at one time they had 170. And I've told the governor how I need 1,100 troopers, and he didn't bat an eye. He said, I agree. But the problem is trying to recruit today is extremely difficult, and retention is difficult as well. But the two biggest problems we face in law enforcement are addiction and mental health. Sounds strange coming from a 40-year law enforcement veteran who spent time in Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, working the cartels, to stand here and tell you we need to do a better job when it comes to drug enforcement. I'm a firm believer in enforcement. We have beefed up our interdiction efforts in trying to catch those people, bringing the poison into the Commonwealth. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue to punish them severely as they should be. But we also have to recognize that there are some people that are addicted, not by choice, but by happenstance. And we need to do what we can to help those people before they ever get into the criminal justice system. When I was the, I was the chief in Jefferson Town for nine years, and one day I was sitting in my office and one of my staff members comes in, running into my office, hysterical. And I won't mention his name, but I said, man, what is wrong? He said, Chief, it's my daughter. She's dying. So I grabbed him. We jumped in my car. We drove about five blocks from the police station, went into his daughter's house, and there she was, 24 years old, lying on the living room floor, dead of an overdose. The wife then shows up, who is a good friend of mine, and, and she's wanting to run in the front door to be with her daughter, and I'm saying, you can't do that. We have to process this scene. And I held her in my arms until the coroner got there, pronounced her dead, processed the scene, and I took her inside and let her be with her daughter for about 20 minutes where she held her in her arms, sobbing. Then I learned that I had a young officer whose twin brother died of an overdose. And then another time in Jefferson Town, I hear the bell ring where we've had our liquor store robbed. Cooch Liquors is on the town square in Jefferson Town. Everybody in Jefferson Town knows if you're going to rob someplace, don't rob Cooch Liquors because their gun's bigger than yours. And the bell rang, and I heard that there had been a robbery and a shooting there. A young heroin-addicted person went into the front door of Cooch Liquors, pulled a fake gun that looked real on the guy behind the counter. The guy behind the counter pulls a gun, a real gun, shoots the kid in the chest. The kid survived. How he did it, I don't know. But he rolls out, gets into the car with three of his best friends. They took him two blocks around the corner and threw him out in the parking lot. That's what addiction does to you. So I decided, you know, we've got to do something. We're going to continue, and I don't apologize for locking up bad guys. That's what we do. But we've got to help those people that are addicted. I had another friend whose son, star quarterback, broke his ankle, went to a doctor, was overprescribed medication, became addicted. These are the kinds of people we need to try and help. So how do we do that? I had a young sergeant, or she was a patrolman at the time in Jefferson Town, a very progressive young girl, very smart, and we talked about it, and she told me about a, two or three different things that are working throughout the country, and I, I learned more about what's called the ANGEL Initiative. The ANGEL Initiative was started in Gloucester, Massachusetts by Chief Leonard Campanella. I got on the phone, I called Leonard, and I invited him to J-Town. I had a round table in J-Town where I invited police, fire, EMS, um, people from the courts, uh, Judge Burke, David, people like that, that we need to all join forces and work together. But I also invited people that are in recovery to sit with us at that table. Chief Campanella briefed us on how it was working in Gloucester and how they were bringing people addicted before they ever got into the criminal justice system into treatment. We rolled our sleeves up. I worked with the healing place and I was commissioned, uh, the state police commissioner, April 1st, 2016. Shortly after I left Jefferson Town, it came to fruition. 
They now have an angel initiative in Jefferson Town. What, what is the angel initiative? It allows police departments to open the front door of the police station and say, if you're addicted, before you get into robbing the liquor store, you come to us and we'll help you get into treatment. And it works. I, uh, I was very fortunate to watch that kick off. They have introduced a number of people into, into treatment. And I thought, how do I do that statewide? We have 16 posts throughout the Commonwealth. And as I told you, we're ex extremely understaffed. But I said, you know what? We're going to do this statewide. We're going to open the front door to the state police post and say, if you're addicted, come to the post and we'll help you get, a, get treatment. We were fortunate to have Operation Unite in southeast Kentucky. They have 32 counties they're responsible for. They helped us kick this off. We had a soft opening in Pikeville. Uh, back in uh, 2017, uh, where we opened it up in our Pikeville Post and our Richmond Post. But then this year, we had the hard rollout. We announced the ANGEL initiative, and so far, the state police has facilitated getting towards 60 people into treatment. Now, that's not as easy as it sounds, because trust me, I'm an old-school cop. And when I first started talking about the ANGEL initiative, cops looked at me like I had two heads. They said, boss, you're crazy as hell. That's not going to work. So I had to change the culture of law enforcement to agree that the solution is not locking everybody up. We're going to lock some people up because that's what we're supposed to do. But we're going to also help people get into treatment. So I had to change the culture of police officers to accept the program. One was a salty old sergeant in J-Town. He's the guy said, chief, you're crazy as hell. And... Uh, I hadn't been with the state police too awfully long, and I went back to Jefferson Town to the Gaslight Festival, which is our big uh, fun event in J-Town. And uh, being cheap, I parked in the police parking lot so I wouldn't have to pay to park. And uh, w when I rolled in, what I saw was this sergeant walk out the front door, and I had learned that that sergeant lost his middle son to addiction, overdose. I saw that sergeant walk out and greet this this mother and father, it was obvious it was a mother and father and a son. The son was in the back seat. They opened the door, and this kid probably weighed 95 pounds. He looked sick. It was obvious to me, <clears throat> it was obvious to me what he was there for. The sergeant walked out the front door, arm in arm with the mother, the father, and the kid that's addicted, and prayed with them in the front parking lot. Then took the kid inside and facilitated facilitated getting that kid into treatment. So the ANGEL initiative is working. We're open for business at the Kentucky State Police. If you have someone in your family that doesn't have active warrants, they haven't robbed a liquor store, if they want to get help before they get into the criminal justice system, they can come and see us and we'll, we'll, we'll facilitate getting them into treatment. But what this is going to, what's going to need to happen is this is going to have to be a collaborative effort among law enforcement, practitioners in this field. You can't say we don't have a bed. You have to have a bed. Because when they come in and say, I'm sick, I need help, they need a bed right then and there. You can't say, come back in two weeks, they may be dead. So we're working with a lot of different uh, addiction recovery companies in Kentucky. They've been very receptive. Uh, and, and, and so far it's working. And, and you might ask, you know, the Kentucky State Police, and, and I'll tell you, we're a full service agency. We do, we do traffic, we do uh, robbery investigations, homicide investigations, we do it all. But I really feel like this is just important, as important as anything we're doing. When I became commissioner, I also created a CERT team, a critical incident response team. I took six of my best investigators, put them in a unit, and said, we're going to respond to any officer-involved shooting. We started that in January in 2017, and last year alone, we responded to 31 officer-involved shootings. That's hard to believe, that we're having that much violence, that much shooting going on in the Commonwealth. But I attributed a lot of that to both addiction and mental illness. And in many cases, they're one and the same. But I just 
heard about an incident in my old hometown in Jefferson Town where a, a mentally deranged individual went into the Kroger and shot a man and a woman, shot them dead, simply because they were African American. You know, they're discussing if it's, is it a hate crime or, or not. You know, there's definitely hate in his heart. But we also know that he had a history of mental illness. How did that person end up at Kroger with a weapon where he could shoot people and kill them? We're not dealing well with mental illness. We need to talk more about it. We need to get more people involved. When I was a young cop in Jefferson County, we had a place to take those people suffering from mental illness. And we thought back then, well, we're mistreating those people. And in many cases, we were. But we've got to come up with a better solution than taking people mentally ill to jail. Mentally ill people need to be in a hospital, and they need to stay in the hospital in some cases. And most people won't admit that. In some cases, we can give them the medication they need, get them out, and they can be re very productive citizens. But sometimes we need to, to deal with them, but not in a penitentiary, in a hospital. The uh, other case I'll talk about that I, that I mentioned was the shooting at Marshall County High School. This young man, we can't explain why, but for some reason went into his high school at 7.57 a.m. and proceeded to shoot people. This kid is not right. So we need to do better with regard to mental illness. We need to do better when it comes to addiction. And I'll just throw out a couple figures here. Why, why should we be concerned with the addiction issue? Well, it's creating a lot of the crime that we see every day in law enforcement. And in 2017, we had 1,565 Kentuckians die of overdose. We compare that to 782 fatalities we had on the highways. You think of a trooper, you think of working the highway, trying to stop speeders or trying to work accidents and that sort of thing. But that's why we need to focus on the problem of addiction. 71,000 people nationwide died last year to addiction. So if we can get to them before they ever need to get into a robbery scenario, we're all better off. So I, I am happy to announce that we're alive and well at the Kentucky State Police. We look forward to working with each and every one of you. I'm, I'm a city cop. I was raised a city cop. That's how I police. But now I'm a, a cop out in the state. And I know we can't do it without partnering with marshals and chiefs in smaller communities. So if the Kentucky State Police can ever be of any assistance to you, please don't hesitate to call upon me personally or one of our post areas. Thank you very much.